Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in 1 Kings chapters 19 and 20. And in chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, we see that despite the amazing, miraculous proof of God's power and greatness and reality over the false gods that Ahab and Jezebel worshipped from chapter 18, well, King Ahab's recollection of those events focused on Elijah's slaughtering of the prophets of Baal. And interestingly here, Jezebel's response, her threat by messenger to Elijah, actually gives the prophet time to escape. And he has quite the long journey. Uh, we just are seeing him leave from Jezreel to Beersheba, and yet that's about 80 or so miles from that northern kingdom of Israel, Jezreel up there, and Beersheba, which is really on the southernmost parts of Judah. Longing to die, Elijah is instead supernaturally provided for twice, giving him the energy to get to make the over 200 mile trip from Beersheba to Mount Horeb, otherwise known as Mount Sinai, where the Lord came to Israel and gave Moses the Ten Commandments and the law during the Exodus. Now, it would not have taken Elijah 40 days and 40 nights if he just walked straight to Mount Horeb from Beersheba. Instead, the Lord caused Elijah to meander as he went to take his time. And it's really a way of pointing back to two things. One, to the 40 days that Moses was on the mountain without food and water from Exodus 34, verse 8, and also to point back to the 40 years of Israel's wandering in the wilderness after their time at Mount Sinai. Now, in chapter 19, verses 9 through 21, we do see a parallel between the Lord passing by Moses on the same mountain in Exodus 34 and this event right here with Elijah. The Lord passed by before, before Moses and Elijah on Mount Horeb. The Lord revealed his character and his will to both Moses and Elijah. And, of course, both prophets obeyed God Afterward, For Elijah, the Lord first caused just a really hurricane-level wind, then an earthquake, then a fire to hit the mountain, kind of as a vanguard of sorts, heralding his presence. And then the Lord speaks to the prophet in the midst of a gentle breeze. One set of commentators, Patterson and Austell, they said, Elijah's recognition of God's voice in the gentle whisper should have been a lesson for Elijah. Even God did not always operate in the realm of the spectacular. That's important for us to remember as well. We'll circle back around to that in a little bit. God commanded Elijah to anoint a couple of kings, Hazael over Aram, and Jehu as eventual king over Israel, and to also anoint the prophet Elisha to replace Elijah, and Elijah does all of that. All three, by the way, of them, Hazael, Jehu, and Elisha are going to be used as tools of judgment by the Lord in Israel, on Israel, leaving them with a minor remnant, which later will get taken into exile by Assyria. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 43, the Lord, uh, which is really the whole chapter there, the Lord used other prophets in Israel while Elijah was out of town. God was not uh, focused only on Elijah. He is doing all these things to bring about his will at all times. These prophets, while they're in Israel, they promise two successive victories for Ahab over the Arameans. The Arameans, by the way, at that time were under Ben-Hadad, and they were not yet under Hazael. And note that the reason, the reason God wants Israel victorious over the Arameans is because of the latter's blasphemy of the Lord. Look at verses 23 and 28. What do they say? They're saying, well, God is only a God of some place, right? Not a God of every place. Place. In fact, you look there clearly at verse 28 in chapter 20, and we read, Thus says the Lord, because the Arameans have said, The Lord, Yahweh, is a God of the mountains, but he's not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. There's only one true God, and he is God of all, right? Of every location at once. Also, notice here that Ahab is indeed victorious. The prophets were not false ones. They were true. But he receives judgment from the Lord because he fails to put Ben-Hadad of Aram to death. And instead, he makes peace with that blasphemer. And note at the end of the chapter, Ahab is sullen and vexed. That's how the NASB puts it. I think that's very appropriate. He's not a repentant. That's the key difference here. He's just upset that things are not going to go his way. We're going to see that actually in chapter 21 as well when we look next time.
Well, a couple principles that we need to remember that we can see from these two chapters and we need to seek to apply to our lives. One, uh, No wonder it's Moses and Elijah who appeared to Peter and James and John as Jesus was transfigured. Those two prophets had a shared experience on the mountain of God with the Lord passing by before them and revealing his character and will. And as we see in Matthew 17, 1 through 5, that transfiguration, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And this is where we can really remember this passage and seek to apply it to our hearts. Because while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Notice, Jesus is the one that stands out from Moses and Elijah. He's not just a prophet. He's the very Son of God. He's the Savior of all who cry out to him in repentance and faith. And that's what we need to do. If you are not in the Lord yet, you need to do that this very day. You need to remember that you're a sinner just like all of us and that God is holy and that he will punish you for your sin unless you trust in Jesus Christ who went to the cross so that he could take that punishment for you. Just turn to him in repentance and faith and let us worship Jesus and never hold anyone else up to the esteem that we give Christ. Even the great prophets such as Moses and Elijah, they do not meet the standard that is Jesus Christ. And also, we need to remember this little passage about the, the quiet, the gentle whisper that the Lord speaks to Elijah. You know, there's a lot of false teaching that has arisen based on that chapter, 1 Kings 19. False teachers uh, love to say that one must wait and listen for the still, small voice of the Lord before knowing how to act or speak, before knowing what decisions they are to make. But we have to remember that the Lord's speaking to man is completed in his written revelation, the word of God. And notice that the word of the Lord came to Elijah multiple times before and after that gentle breeze. Chapter 17, verses 2 and 8 and 14. Chapter 18, verses 1 and 36. Chapter 19, verse 9. Chapter 21, verses 17 and 28. Multiple times in 2 Kings as well that Elijah is going to hear the word of the Lord. And again, for us today, we have God's word completed. His whole revelation, his special revelation is given and we have it in his word. And we need to remember that God's word is referred to with powerful language throughout scripture. Jeremiah 23, 29 is not my word like fire declares Yahweh and like a hammer which shatters a rock. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, God does not need to produce outwardly supernatural phenomena and signs to do his work. The most miraculous work God does is actually in the inward regeneration of a sinner into a follower of Christ as they trust in the Lord's gracious gift of Jesus to die on the cross, experiencing God's wrath in their place. And there's continued miracle in the sanctification of a Christian to become progressively more mature, more Christ-like with each passing day. As the Holy Spirit quietly directs our minds, not quietly speaking to us in a whisper, but directs our minds to his revealed word, illuminating it for us, helping us to understand God's word and how to apply it to our lives. And when we think of Elijah on that mountain, that's what we need to remember, not waiting for some austere, magnificent sign to come crashing down, but remembering that God's given us his word and he's called that our will in 1 Thessalonians 4 is supposed to be our sanctification. His will is our sanctification. That is what we need to seek in our lives as we continue to pray for the Lord to direct us to do what he would like us to do, what he wants us to do, what he commands us to do, and where he wants us to go to obey him. This has been First Kings chapters 19 and 20, and I hope you have a great day.